from the veterinary medicine point of view, what are the effects of stress for you and I? And the first thing to remember, of course, is that stress starts before the cat even leaves its home to come to your clinic. So as soon as the owner brings that cat carrier out, and sometimes I think as soon as the cat hears the owner make the appointment on the phone, the stress starts. So this um, uh, picture on the left there I think just says it all. There's the cat in the car saying, uh, we're all going to die. The dog says, yay, you know, they're really happy, let's go in the car. And the cat says, no, we are all going to die. So just getting into the carrier, getting into the car is stressful for the cat. And then by the time they get into our waiting room, they're uh, in an unfamiliar place. There, there are predators sitting next to them. So these are all the things that we need to think about and realize that that stress is starting before they even reach our exam room. So there's some nice data that was published um, just back in 2011 um, actually quantifying the effects on vital signs what happens when cats come to the clinic. And this was based on 30 cats that were owned by students and staff at Colorado State University. And these cats were examined, and these clinical, these vital signs were recorded first at home and then in the clinic in the same day. And so what you can see in this chart is the median values for blood pressure, rectal temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate recorded first at home and then later the same day in the clinic and then in the far right column is the maximum change recorded, the difference between uh, the, the, the um, value recorded at home versus the value recorded in the clinic. So the maximum difference in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, for example, was as much as 31 millimeters of mercury. So that, that we'll talk a little bit more about white coat hypertension in a minute. Rectal temperature can increase as much as two degrees. Heart rate as much as 76 beats per minute. And respiratory rate as much as 100. That's a huge increase in respiratory rate, huge maximum change. So these physiologic parameters are, are highly changeable when cats come into the clinic. And of course, that can confound our evaluation of them. Are they really hypertensive or not? Do they have a fever or not? Um, uh, these are things that we all get used to trying to uh, understand um, in our patients. Here's another phenomenon that may not be quite as familiar to you. It's this um, uh, physiologic heart murmur called a dynamic right ventricular outflow obstruction. It's a cause of systolic murmurs in cats. So this is a reversible physiologically induced heart murmur caused by a dynamic narrowing of that right ventricular outflow tract, and it's catecholamine induced. We can see it in some disease, non-cardiac disease states. So this is why some hyperthyroid cats, for example, have systolic heart murmurs. It's why you see uh, heart murmurs, reversible heart murmurs in anemic cats, so high outflow states will do this. But it also, also can be induced by catecholamines. And so that's that acute stress response where they're flooded with catecholamines. And this accounts for sometimes why you see cats that sometimes have a systolic heart murmur in the clinic and sometimes they don't. They may be one of these cats that's um, experiencing this reversible physiologic type of heart murmur. Um, so, of course, the other phenomenon that really confounds us is the white coat effect. This has been known for a long time in cats. This is one of the first studies that evaluated this in cats back in 1999, Scott Brown's group, where they looked um, at six healthy cats, uh, normal cats, and seven chronic kidney disease cats. And they evaluated heart rate and blood pressure using a little radio uh, telemetry device. You can see it there on the screen. It's really small. It uh, just weighs a gram or two. It's just a couple of centimeters in length. They're an implantable radio telemetry device that allowed them to collect that data without handling the cats. So what they did is they evaluated these cats in a colony, their familiar colony setting, and then they simulated a clinic visit where they put them in a cat carrier and then they took them on a car ride around the campus. Then they brought them back into a, a staged waiting room that had a beagle in it and made them sit there for 10 minutes, then took them into an exam room and then did a, uh, their a heart rate assessment and a Doppler blood pressure assessment. So they compared that radio telemetry data collected in their familiar setting, home type of setting, if you will, to what um, data was collected after the simulated um, clinic visit. And here's what they found. They found, uh, as, you know, again, as you would guess, a significant difference um, 
uh, depending on uh, when the, the, uh, the, the data was collected. And uh, I've stratified it there by the normal cats versus the chronic kidney disease cats. And you can see that one of the things I wanted you to see anyway on this data was that chronic kidney disease cats have an even exaggerated response compared to the healthy cats. So for the blood pressure, the normal cats would have a mean increase of 16 or 17 millimeters of mercury, but the chronic kidney disease cats when, could go up over 20 millimeters of mercury increase. And for heart rate, it was um, exaggerated as well. So the normal healthy cats could have their heart rate go up a mean of up to you know, over 30 beats per minute, but the chronic kidney disease cats could have their mean uh, heart rate go up over 50 beats per minute. So for some disease states, that stress response even uh, further exaggerates collection of normal vital signs like heart rate and like systolic um, blood pressure. So this white cone effect is definitely a confounding issue, and, and I wanted to um, ask you uh, this question about how much time you would typically allow for uh, acclimation, because you know we all think about allowing for acclimation of uh, uh, the cat before we go ahead and measure the uh, blood pressure. So. I'm interested to see if you know you would typically allow five or ten minutes of acclimation in the clinic setting before you would go ahead and take the blood pressure. Would you try to allow a little bit longer? Would you allow 15 to 20 minutes? Or have you kind of given up on that and said, you know, it, it doesn't doesn't seem to matter. You're like, no matter how much time I allow, um, I still have this issue of uh, of white coat hypertension getting getting in the way.